Thank you for that uh, warm introduction and also for the recognition of my father. Um, the, um, the loss of my father sits heavily on me today, um, but I was determined in his honour to make sure that I presented to you because I reached out to the society um, in 2020, uh, um, early on, um, before COVID. And I knew a conference was to be held in August that year. And I said to dad, you know, because he always came. And mother had just passed away in the prior September, which also sat heavily on all of us and indeed on my father. And I said, dad, can I take you? Can we go together? And maybe they'd give me a gig. <laughs> <clears throat> And um, indeed, so I reached out, uh, reached out and uh, you warmly accepted um, that, that idea. Um, but of course, COVID derailed the best laid plans of mice and men. And uh, so it, um, it didn't enable me to bring father, which was my um, dearest wish, uh, to, to share the conference with him and to d do something um, uh, for you. Um, reflective of my, not just my current role, but in a way my, my journey and legal life um, with such a wonderful father and indeed mother. Um, and um, the, that year though, the, the 2020, so um, allow me just one, one minute of reflection with, on my father. And I must say, we gave him the best funeral ever uh, yesterday in St. James, which is the... Um, uh, in the heart uh, of the, the, the legal circle in the old way. Um, and, and St. James Church is traditionally so associated with the legal profession in New South Wales. And every year there is an opening of law term service, which is held at St. James. And in which I sing in that as part of the bar choir. And the bar choir also, um, Father asked if they would sing, and 20 strong, which was amazing um, yesterday, they, they, they all sang most wonderful music. Father also chose all of the hymns, all the oldies and the goodies, and he chose the organ music that he would like, and I added some extra pieces that I, I thought were appropriate to the occasion. I also played one uh, on oboe, um, uh, the... Um, Dido's Lament from Dido and Aeneas, if you know it, which is an absolutely soul-wrenching lament um, um, uh, for death. And I played the oboe <clears throat> that my father had gone to Paris to pick up for me for my 21st birthday. Um, and so I, I, I played that um, with a string quartet from the Sydney Lawyers Orchestra. So it had music and law all through it. And at the conclusion of the ceremony, um, there was the tolling of bells. Oh, I should say, in the application form for funeral service at St. James, it has a number of options, one of which is um, live streaming. Of course, we wanted that for family all over the world. It's a wonderful boon of COVID, the enthusiasm with which we've embraced the opportunity to say farewell to people um, in, in, in that context. Um, but another option was bell ringers, and of course, at St. James, they have real bell ringers, like they do in Midsummer Murders in a number of the plots. <laughs> but they do have real bell ringers. And part of the funeral tradition in bell ringing is they ring the number of years that the person lived. So at the conclusion of the service, there was a tolling of the bells for the full 100. And as I said at the end of my contribution to the eulogy, father would really have loved that. <laughs> and the, um, yeah, so it was a splendid, splendid um, farewell. Um, you can see it if you are interested. It's um, at the St. James King Street website has got um, a little link which talks about if you'd like to watch things and they've got a, Going down that, they have got a link to previous services, and it's it's well flagged um, to find it on the website. So, um, my talk today, um, I've given it this title: "Wither Human Rights and Freedoms Protections in Australia: Rights and Freedoms in the Age of COVID-19." 
And I had, when I was thinking about it, um, and seeing that I was initially scheduled in the program with Anne Toomey and Janina Buffy, the program seemed to put all we excellent women together, which was a fabulous triptych had we been able to do it together. Um, but um, given that uh, Janina in particular has written in, in large measure and extremely well about the challenges to executive accountability in the consequences of uh, COVID-19, I thought any contribution I might make of, in that kind, and I have written a number of things on that subject, would pale in comparison to her um, presentation. So I thought I would take a different journey. And I thought I would um, talk about some of the the, the things that I've learned in my, my role um, as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, a key statutory office in the portfolio of agencies that sit within the Attorney General's portfolio. The first part of my title, though, Wither Human Rights and Freedoms Protections, is an echo of a conference I attended many years ago in which the late, the Honourable Roddy Marr, AOQC, was a keynote speaker. The title of that conference was Wither Equity, with a well-placed question mark. I remembered the conference and the title well. I liked the homophonic pun of Wither, Wither, and the question mark. I also remembered the deference then paid Justice Marr with speakers dropping behoves in like confetti in linguistic deference to the very articulate, eloquent and somewhat old-fashioned judge. I had the great pleasure of teaching equity with Roddy at Sydney University for a number of years. I found him interesting. <laughs> Coming into my current role, which is now nearly five years ago, I came into it after 10 years at the Australian Law Reform Commission, another key statutory office in the uh, portfolio of agencies under the Attorney General. I had many questions, and I sought to answer these questions for this role in a thematic way through the vehicle of speeches and articles over the years. I have a particular view about my role as president of this com commission, and I see it as quasi-judicial. All of the complaint handling functions of the Human Rights Commission are vested in me, no one else, in me. They have not been the responsibility of any of the other commissioners in the commission for over 20 years. And while we do not make determinations in matters that come to the commissioner's complaints, I do see my role as the position in which all of those functions are vested as quasi-judicial. So it has framed the way that I have approached my role and particularly my public engagement on various issues pertaining to rights and freedoms, which is to say I would prefer to put my thoughts in considered writing as today rather than through social media. I also came into my role after a period of intense scrutiny of the Commission and also of some of the commissioners. And I set as a personal goal to ensure that the commission was not in the headlines for the wrong reasons, that the focus should be on our work and any engagement was with our work, rather than ad hominem challenges of commissioners and indeed the president. But in order to take on the role, I needed to understand about what our role is as a national commission and about the breadth of our mandates. I needed to understand about the complaints jurisdiction and I needed to look into how Australia protects rights and freedoms. I needed to lead a national human rights institution 
in a federal system. So in the time I have with you today, which isn't long, and I will keep to time, I have written a paper, so if our time runs out, then I will share my written paper with you. I thought I would share some of my journey through some of the questions I put to myself and how new questions have emerged over the past two years, as well as the underscoring of the importance of the questions that I had in the first place. It is a personal reflection on my journey through a role that um, can and should appropriately be in focus for the right reasons. As I reflect on the past two years, it is clear that the pandemic has brought a renewed national focus on the importance of centralising the consideration of rights and freedoms during times, and cri times of crisis, a greater rights consciousness, I would describe it. But our challenge in the after is to ensure that human rights remain central to government decision making on an ongoing basis. In, in some way or another, and I'm sure many of the speakers over the course of the, the proceedings have spoken to this, each and every one of us has encountered restrictions on freedom of movement, the right to peaceful protest, the ability to engage in public areas without wearing masks, and the requirement to provide personal information for the purpose of contact tracing. Thankfully, many of those restrictions are now lifting. Australians, for the most part, have been willing to do the right thing, guided by public health advice, informing the restrictions imposed by federal, state and territory governments. Government measures in the interests of protecting the health of the entire community have provided a range of conversations about our rights. And for the most part, I welcome those discussions. But there is room for a deeper understanding of our rights in general and about human rights in particular, and especially about what rights are protected or not under Australian law. In part, this is a conversation about the public understanding of rights. It is also a conversation about the legal architecture or grammar for protecting rights and freedoms in Australia. Other conversations go to accountability, like the ones that Jadina Buffy is central to um, in a general sense. The distinct language of human rights arose principally in the aftermath of the Second World War. The horrors of the Holocaust and the expression of those concerns in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the landmark document adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on the 10th of December, 1948. It was a moment that was embraced and marked across Australia. The Honourable Michael Kirby, ACCMG, remembers clearly that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was given to every school child in Australia on that flimsy aerogram paper that a number of you may remember. What was distinctive about the Universal Declaration was its move away from an international law that was about the rights of states among themselves to an international law of human rights, which confers rights on individual men and women, and in a context where the United Nations had a role to play. The declaration was followed by two other major international instruments, which together with the Universal Declaration are labelled the International Bill of Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Australia was a founding signatory to each of these instruments, as well as to the Charter of the United Nations itself. We stepped forward in embracing the commitments of, this, of these great instruments. 
Australia has signed and ratified each of the key international treaties since. And it has not been a party political embracing of such treaties either. I put that question to myself. Is this a Labor project? I got out a red pen for Labor. I got out a blue pen for the coalition. I went through the, it was, there were 21 moments of signing and ratification. The plus one, let's say that's the second optional protocol on the abolition of the death penalty. No one would quibble about that one. But for the 20 others, red pen, blue pen, red pen, blue pen, dead heat. It should not be considered a party, party political matter at all. Sovereign domestic parliaments may not want to be ruled by Geneva, as one of the phrases go, goes, but signing up to the international community through its conventions, declarations, covenants and treaties does affect what sover sovereign parliaments do. It's, it's not so much about rule by Geneva, but about reflecting sincerely upon those deep commitments in one's domestic fields of operations. However, little has been done to enact the rights and freedoms protected by these instruments into Australian law, despite the aspirations, perhaps encouraged in the school children of Michael Kirby's young years. This means that the, the rights and freedoms enshrined in these international human rights instruments are not directly enforceable in Australia. Our promises to the world, while genuine and above politics, are not backed up fully in practice. So something like freedom of speech, contained in Article 19 of the ICCPR, for example, is found implied in the limited freedom of political communication as a legislative limit, not a positive right, in the Constitution, and in things like the limits on it expressed in defamation law and the constraints of unlawful discrimination. But if you wanted to pin it down more directly, other than in hyperbole, to explain to, say, the man on the Clapham omnibus or the Bondi tram, you'd be struggling. It is the vibe, but it's not in law. So about the Australian Human Rights Commission, the first commission was established in 1981, just after Australia had ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, was set up by a coalition government. Dame Roma Mitchell was its then chair, as the title was at the time. It had part-time commissioners as well. In 1986, the current commission was put on a permanent foundation And it was, um, uh, the, the, the commission was established symbolically on the 10th of December, which is International Human Rights Day. The commission itself has a number of broad roles, all statutory. One is a complaints handling role, which it's had since 1981, both for complaints concerning human rights matters involving the covenants referred to in the Act, principally the ICCPR, and complaints of discrimination on specific grounds under the set of anti-discrimination acts. There are also reporting functions and education functions, intervention and amicus functions, and there is growing international engagement, especially through intergovernmental initiatives embraced by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. When the commission was put on a permanent foundation, it was designed in tandem with an accompanying Australian Bill of Rights Act. The bill was passed in the House of Reps but did not survive the Senate. The functions under the ICCPR for Australia do remain in a schedule to the Australian Human Rights Commission Act, enabling complaints to be brought to the Commission so even without a formal enactment of the Covenant as a Bill of Rights Act, people can bring a complaint on the basis of the ICCPR rights to us at the Commission. In the past two and a half years, this jurisdiction has become especially important. 
freedom of movement, association, of speech, of privacy, the right to leave and to enter one's own country. All ICCPR rights have prompted complaints under this original jurisdiction of the Commission during the pandemic. But these complaints are completely different complaint from complaints that are grounded in the anti-discrimination laws, which make conduct unlawful. The complaints under the scheduled instruments begin a conversation, but in the absence of specific domestic legislation anchoring them, let alone the possibility of effective remedies, the jurisdiction is somewhat hollow. And while the model of the, the types of protection that have been introduced in the ACT Queensland and Victoria uh, is nothing like the, the model in the US, just because everyone else has one doesn't mean that we necessarily need one federally. But from the perspective of the Commission's jurisdiction, it is still unfinished legal architecture. In terms of our statute, we are like a donut with a hole in the middle. For my own part, I've had somewhat of a road to Damascus conversion on the idea of and the need for an Australian Human Rights Act and embedding human rights thinking more directly in our laws and decision making. I must confess though, that I started with a great deal of resistance to the idea of a Human Rights Act in Australia before I came into this role. The experience of the Constitutional Bill of Rights in America and litigation about rights in court so publicly played out were somewhat discouraging. My background is also very much as a property lawyer and a private common lawyer, so I rather liked Matthew's discussion about the ideas of property in the, um, the, the paper I heard just before the morning tea break. But our constitutional drafters took a completely different approach from the US. The propelling force for our constitution was not revolution or war, it was simply a deal among the states. It was about what bits the, the feds got and what bits we kept as sovereign uh, state parliaments. It's an entirely different approach. But it also means that, that our approach to protection of um, rights is somewhat different. It's not that our constitution was opposed to rights but rather opposed to judges having power to protect them from interference by legislation. So those who drafted our constitution preferred to place their trust in parliament to preserve the nature of our society and regarded as undemocratic guarantees which fettered its powers. Parliament is indeed pivotal as the vehicle of rights protection. Whether it has been able to do this appropriately as considered through the lens of COVID responses is a central issue for continued reflection. So what changed my thinking? It was a, a journey in three parts, and I'll whip through this and leave for further reflection the um, presentation of it. First, these are the three steps on my road to Damascus journey. The first was the limitations of the common law. The common law can get stuck Protection of privacy, I would suggest, protection of serious invasions of privacy, needs a great leap forward, as it achieved in Donoghue and Stevenson in relation to negligence. But we have not got there yet. Perhaps the age of drones is the contemporary equivalent of the age of railroads to provide the necessary catalyst for the common law. Number one, common law can get stuck. Number two, is the negative expression of rights. The problem of much of our human rights protections in Australia is that they are framed in the negative in terms of what you can't do. This is the way that our set of four federal discrimination laws work. Our discrimination laws are also reflective of the times and context of their introduction since 1975. The political compromises which drove them have been forgotten 
And what was envisaged as a temporary expedient to secure passage of legislation becomes part of the permanent structure of the law without thinking why. Why was it there? What is its purpose now? Is that purpose still relevant or necessary today? Should the protections go further? Should the definitions be consistent? These are all good law reform questions. The third step is the effectiveness of the complaint handling processes. And that was to see that over all of the years since 1981, the Commission has handled complaints from people through a vast range of um, means. Every year on average, let me give you some quick stats, every year on average, pre-COVID, we receive 15,000 inquiries from individuals and businesses wanting to know about the law, wanting to know what they can do. Sometimes those inquiries lead to the making of a complaint, which is the mechanism under our Act. We have 2,000 of those a year, all of which are handled by mediation. We do not make any determinations about anything. The mediators work in a confidential way as, as best practice mediation works, and they also have uh, secrecy provisions which affect what they can do. So as those statistics tick over, if you were to look at, for instance, from the 20 years to 2018, the numbers in that 20-year period represented successful alternative dispute re resolution for more than 30,000 people and organisations. That's just in that 20-year period. I'll leave further analysis to the written paper. As I can see, I have um, Time's winged chariot hurrying near. Um, let me just whip then to the final remarks. Our current system for protecting human rights, I would suggest, lacks a sufficient level of proficiency or fluency to converse in human rights terms when discussing issues of major concern to the community. The past two years, I would suggest, has brought this into sharp relief. People are talking about rights, people are demanding their rights, governments are defending their incursions on people's freedoms in terms of rights. Human rights approaches provide a way to talk about the solution. I would suggest that a human rights-based approach gives us the grammar we need. So my final point goes to my grandchildren, indulge me on that one. So in asking the question whether human rights protections in Australia, I think of my grandchildren. My grandson, Alessandro, spotted the Magna Carta on the wall in my study, a lovely facsimile produced by the Rule of Law Institute in 2015. He said, Grandma, you have the Magna Carta on your wall. He was seven. How did he know about it? Through horrible histories on television. <laughs> It was a story of King John exceeding power without accountability to Parliament, um, part of which, of course, led in due course to the Glorious Revolution several centuries later. I should put, I've publicly announced many times that I am indeed a, a great supporter of constitutional monarchy. But how does, how does my uh, grandson's spotting of this on the wall, how does this lead to a conversation about human rights, about rights in Australia today? It is hardly the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that young Michael Kirby took home. It's not even what you might describe as a highly accessible document in the medieval Latin of the early 13th century. It is iconic, perhaps the vibe of our understanding of rights but over breakfast with your grandchildren? How about this one? Nulli vendemos, nulli negabimos, aut differemos rectum aut judiciam. <laughs> to no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay right to justice. That's the access to justice provision. Great with cornflakes. Anyway, but even if there were direct laws about rights, it doesn't mean that everything is a right nor does it mean that rights are unqualified. And all human rights come with the corresponding responsibility to protect and respect the rights of others. Having a greater embedding of human rights as Australian law 
would give, give us a way to help our future generations, let alone our present ones, to understand and exercise their rights and freedoms better. It, in, it would ensure that human rights and freedoms do not wither. So I will leave it there. This was part of my journey, and I am very delighted that you've allowed me to share it with you. Thank you. Thank you.